May I welcome you to the Wednesday, November 5, 2014 meeting of the Metro Vision Issues Committee of Dr. Cog. We are now convened at approximately 4.03 p.m. in our uh, regular meeting site, what uh, I sometimes like to think of as the first floor ballroom of uh, the Dr. Cog offices. Uh, because sometimes it seems like we do dance a little bit. Um, <clears throat> we have at this time then uh, noted for the record, and we're circulating the uh, uh, attendance sheet, please, for you to sign in, uh, but that we have a sufficient number convened for purposes of our conduct of business. The first order of business is the public comment period, and we now make this time available for people to address matters to Metrovision Issues Committee, uh, we do request that there be no public comments on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held uh, before the Board of Directors. Uh, at this point in time, let me open the floor to anyone who would like to approach the podium and make public comment. And that's going once, going twice, are you all done? Are you all in? Then we have closed the public comment period. You have before you as attachment A the summary of the October 1, 2014 meeting. Uh, that is, as you will recall, provided to you for informational purposes and your review. No formal action is necessary relative to that because we don't adopt these formally as minutes, but they are presented to you and obviously if anyone had any uh, questions or burning desire to make a notation, they could certainly feel free to contact Connie in that regard. Uh, hearing no specific comments or concerns relative to that, let's turn to our one and only action item that we have. And this is a motion that we are seeking to recommend to the Board of Directors the amendment of the Policy on Transportation Improvement Program, that's the TIP preparation and specifically procedures for preparing the 2016-2021 TIP to include the second phase project selection. You will recall at our last meeting that we did have extensive discussion relative to the second phase project selection criteria and we have now embodied those in the attachment B that is in your materials. And to present to us on that, I'm happy to introduce our Director of Transportation Planning and Operations, Mr. Doug Rex. Good afternoon, Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, you will recall last month we did formalize um, the recommendation of MVIC, and I, I also mentioned to you what we had planned to do because it, it is an actual amendment. Oh. Um, it's an am <laughs> Thank you, sir. It's an amendment to the TIP policy document that we, that we were going to send it back through our committees. Well, it has gone back through TAC, and they had a couple recommendations that we wanted to bring forth to you today for um, uh, and you know, just mostly clarification and maybe some additional information, which we felt, staff felt, that it was appropriate. Um, to include um, in the information that we provide to you at, during your deliberations during second phase. And those are highlighted within your packet um, and on the screen shown in red italic. Um, I don't know if anybody had any specific questions about those, but I I'll just quickly run through what those two were. Under the multi-jurisdictional projects, um, right now, uh, un with your recommendation, it was projects that cross jurisdictional boundaries of two or more Dr. Cog jurisdictions would be considered a multi-jurisdictional project. Um, uh, TAC, they, they recommend that we they also indicate if, if, those, if those partners were funding partners. If, if, it, if it crosses multiple jurisdictions, were those jurisdictions also funding partners? And there are a few of those, I believe, within, within the, um, um, the applications we received. The second had to do with the number of, pro of sponsored projects selected in first phase. As currently written by you all, the n it, it refers to the number of, of sponsored projects selected in first phase will be noted. Um, the TAC thought it would be important to also include the amount of funds that are awarded in first phase by, by uh, project entity 
and also the total number of projects submitted. So, it's, so you could have a situation in which you know, an entity maybe has three smaller projects versus one larger project, and they just felt that would be useful information for you all um, as, as you're discussing uh, um, second phase. And staff certainly agree with that, and we'd be happy to provide that if that, if that is your wish. So based upon these two comments that TAC has made, obviously it's come back to us then for our approval before going to the board. Are there any questions that anyone has of Doug on this? And then we'll have discussion following that in terms of uh, this, this matter. But first, any specific questions that you have specifically for Doug? Let's go with George and then Chris uh, and Val. Sorry, George, Chris, and Val. Thanks, Doug. So, Doug, um, uh, pertaining to the multi-jurisdictional, um, and I, this might be a stupid question, but funding partners meaning noting if the other jurisdictions had committed funds to that project already? As part of the application. Okay. Yeah. So, so for example, a project in Castle Rock and Castle Pines, for example, one that crosses multiple jurisdictions, did Castle Pines and Castle Rock both both submit funding for that for that uh, application, okay, or, the, or the promise of funding for that, right. the local match? Okay, right. Chris. Thank you. Actually, um, following up on on George's question, so the the distinction there, what would be being noted would be if if a project goes through multiple jurisdictions, the other jurisdictions might sign on. Say, yeah, that's great. You go for it, but they're not actually committing any cash. Correct. This would be in noting right. as useful information, yes, the other jurisdiction has actually ponied up cold hard cash. Indeed. So you could have a situation. Like, so in the, in the spreadsheet we give you, there could be two boxes. One that it crosses multiple jurisdictions, the actual project, physical project. Right. And the second box would be, was it was it shared funding? Right, right. So it could be an extra another check box. Right, and and maybe this is also just a clarifying question on that second one. Mm -hmm. um, so that again, these these red additions are meant to tease out important information. Mm -hmm. So the the main category is how many sponsor projects were selected in the first phase. This is meant to tease out. Well, yeah, okay, they, they got a whole lot of projects in the first phase, and they were all penny ante bike projects or something. Right. So you can take that into account. Careful on that derision coming. <laughs> 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 no, I'm a bike guy. Bike projects are cheap. Rack them up. Spend them. We need more penny ante bike projects. Well, I, I say, well you're going to be shocked. He, he <laughs> means penny, an penny ante in the nicest possible <laughs> way. The nicest possible way. <laughs> Um, and then, and then the number of projects submitted—that's to take into account how many projects they got to submit, because different jurisdictions have different numbers of projects they can submit. So right. yeah, they got a bunch of them in the first phase, but they were—that wasn't because they were super lucky. They actually got to submit a bunch of projects in the first phase. That's that's the additional information that's teasing out. Got it. Thank True. you. All right, Val. Uh, yes, I guess I'll follow up on the, on the first one also. Uh, I, I guess I don't understand if uh, multiple jurisdictions, if uh, both jurisdictions or all jurisdictions uh, put money into it, does that mean they carry more weight to get more points as opposed to uh, a project where it's crossing multiple jurisdictions but only one of them is putting money? Uh, does that carry, does that go? On the lesser, on the least, or uh, on the list of it, or what? What does it really asking? Well, I, I think the first thing I would say is that no projects are scored in second phase, right? So it's, I mean, and what you can, what you consider to be important versus someone else might be different. I mean, some people might might consider the fact that there's multi, there's a commitment from multiple jurisdictions, maybe to be as important, maybe as as it being it just physically crossing multiple jurisdictions. I, I know it's not the answer you're really looking for because it's hard for me to give you an answer because Well, it's well I, under, I understand that, that, that there's not a physical score in there, but they're prioritized somehow. I call that scoring. 
whether you give a point to it or not, you're, you're scoring it, you're prioritizing it, where does it fall on that list? Right. Well, I think it may be fair to say that in, in the overall approach toward creating the assessment of the Tier 2 projects, one of the concepts that we were attempting to address, as I understand it, speaking personally, was, if you will, a general balance of equities. And it, it isn't a hard and fast measure, but rather it's an equitable kind of discernment as to whether or not there's some reason to give this some more attention. Uh, I, I don't even use the word weight, just more attention. Uh, I think it is up to us as the process goes through to make those judgments as we see them. And I, I, I hate to use the phrase, but it's been used in the past effectively. It's sort of, you'll know it when you see it kind of thing, I believe. And that's my view on, on how we've approached this. Is that Indeed. consistent yeah, with perfect. yours? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think the word right. attention is perfect. Thank you. Elise. I wasn't sure, but are we ready to move to our deliberative portion of this discussion? And if so, I would speak to that. Uh, yeah, I think we wanted to have questions first, and now we can talk about this. But uh, there, there may be other considerations, too, that we can put into this mix, and I think that's totally appropriate. So let's open up for discussion now. And Elise, we're always happy to start with you. Well, for the purposes of discussion, I guess I would be willing to put a motion on the table to support the TAC recommended, recommended changes and offer two other minor clarifying edits. And those would be, and these have been identified by folks in sort of looking at making sure that we have clarity about what we're suggesting. Under the paragraph that starts first last mile connection, um, the second paragraph says the path slash service. Path is kind of a sort of specific type of bike facility and it's been discussed that it might be more accurate and descriptive to say the facility slash service because your bike path might be a path or it could be an on lane, uh, you know, on street bike lane, it could be, you know, something else. And so facility is the, the more proper term. So that would be one proposed edit. And the second is in the next paragraph where it says project physically touches transit. That's kind of an ambiguous sort of touching of transit. Um, it sounds like we're reaching out to poke a bus, maybe? I don't know. So instead of saying touching, uh, saying transit, I would say touches a transit property or stop as a useful clarification of what it means to touch transit. <laughs> so again, to r summarize, uh, my motion would be to approve the TAC recommendations with those two additional edits, changing path to facility and changing touching transit to touching a transit property or stop. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. And I think I heard both Roger and Herb second that. Uh, the um, motion on the floor would be to. Oh, it was Phil. I'm sorry. It was Phil. OK, excuse me. It was, it was the equivalent D <coughs> that you should All right. recognize. I'm, I apologize. So it was Phil. And, and I'm working hard not to use titles this time, because last time when I used titles, somebody said, I like them when we're more informal. So Philly over here uh, <laughs> <coughs> seconded uh, Philly, Elise's Philly. <laughs> <laughs> motion. So now we have a motion on the floor. It's appropriate for discussion. Is there any discussion on the motion to approve the TAC recommendations, which are before you in red if you have it in the color printed copy or in italics only if you have it on a different copy and then the two additional changes that Elise articulated about facility substituted for the word path and a transit property or stop substituted for the word transit. Discussion. Chris. Thank you Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, maybe I'm screwing up the order here. Uh, this may be a question or a comment, depending on the answer. The, um, at the top, slide uh, up. Oh, no, wait, up. right there. Expenditure variables, Dr. Cog programmed funds. This is on the, the equity uh, formula, which I want to return to after we've already, after this motion is approved or denied. 
Um, but it, Dr. Cog program funds 2003 to 2019. Um, I, re I remember we had a conversation here about what the window ought to be. And um, if I recall correctly, and this is where I could be stand corrected, that the last tip cycle went back to 2003. Correct. So um, I, that doesn't make any sense. So if, if we have a, if we're measuring uh, the expenditure of Dr. Cog funds to meet transportation needs, and that's measured against uh, the contributions from population employment, VMT, and HUTF, uh, are, are those run all the way back to 2003? I don't think so. I think those are in the present day. Correct. But they're being weighed against expenditures back to 2003, and last tip cycle they were weighed against expenditures back to 2003. Is 2003, you know, the new, you know, zero year? 20 years from now, are we continuing to measure back to 2003? That doesn't, that, that seems perverse to me. Um, both uh, generically it seems perverse, but as a jurisdiction that had a, uh, well, actually, I guess CDOT expenditures are no longer in this, but, you know, large expenditures, we could be paying for them, so to speak, for all of eternity if it's not a rolling window. And it seems like a rolling window makes more sense. If, if we're going to say we're measuring your contributions against what you've gotten, it ought to be what you've gotten in a rolling window, two tip cycles seems reasonable. So I'd like to know what others think about that. If we're going to stick to 2003 as, you know, anno domini for all eternity or if we're going to have a rolling window. I think uh, it is probably fair to say that we might be able to address the motion first, which deals with tier two and then come back to this question unless if Doug has a quick answer then let's go ahead and, and at least get that on the table because it's uh, a legitimate concern. I do remember the discussion about that and I thought actually Val had some thoughts on that too as we talked about it last time but Doug do you, do you want to? Well I mean there really is no answer I mean <laughs> what, 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 is, what is the perfect number of years to use um, you know I mean it was just if, it's what we've used. It. We've always we started with 2003. We've, we've gone back further. If we felt comfortable with the data we had. I don't know, um, but that's that's what we use. I mean, that is certainly what the recommendation was last time to to stick with 2000 to go from 2003 to 2019. It certainly can be changed. Um, you know, I think our thought pro was that you know the more years you had in there, the more the data would be normalized. Um, well, but but I also I understand your your point too with regards to larger. But but that would also that logic would apply to the contribution variables as well. I mean, vehicle miles traveled, population, employment have all altered dramatically in different parts of the Dr. Cog area over the course of 2003 through 2019. Sure. So what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Given the fact that there may be some more discussion about that, I'm going to suggest that we proceed with the motion on the Tier 2 discussion now, because that's properly before us on the table, and then we'll come right back okay. to this discussion. Not to cut it off, we'll have people uh, participate in that, but let's focus on the one, because I, I sense that we may not have a lot of discussion on this, given the nature of the comments that have been made for these changes being uh, really more clarifications and providing assistance <coughs> to us as we look at these and make the assessments in the future. So is there discussion on the motion as made by Elise relative to Tier 2? Roger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think Chris certainly brings up some very good points, but can we assure that 
that date 2003 to 2019 does not affect tier two? Can we be assured? Because otherwise, I think Chris's point is well taken. Fair, fair question. Uh, Doug, the question as I understand it is if we in fact leave this as it is written now, is there a carryover into the assessment of tier two or are these in effect independent criteria that are separately looked at in tier two? Correct. Yeah, they're, they're independent. It, yeah. it wouldn't have any bearing. All right. Other discussion on the main motion then? that we have. Anyone with discussion? George. Well, I'll go ahead and speak in favor of uh, the, um, the the comments that came out of the TAC. I mean, I think it's totally appropriate. I think it gives us that additional amount of information, whether or not we uh, make use, like Val said, uh, as individuals to try to assign any kind of uh, scoring, any kind of priority. At least for me, that's going to give the additional information um, that would help me as a board member to make um, informed decisions. Elise? Just a point of clarification. I think um, the, the word A should go in front of transit property. That was technically my motion, and it makes more sense to say touches A transit property or stop rather than. Gotcha. So. Yeah, uh, and, and that was the motion as made, and I think grammatically you're well taken on that point. Further discussion on the main motion to approve the TAC recommendations and the two edits that Elise proposed for Tier 2. Further discussion on that motion. Hearing none, are we ready for the question? It looks like we are. Would all those in favor please indicate by saying aye? Aye. aye. Are there any opposed? The chair hears none. That passes unanimously. Let's turn back now to the contribution variables slash expenditure variables and specifically focusing on expenditure variables. We do have the articulated time frame of 2003-2019 in the Tier 1 criteria. And the question is raised, if we do that, for expenditure variables, as I hear the question, should we not do that as to contribution variables and do a similar reach back, or should we in fact truncate this period instead of saying 2003, shorten it to, for example, the last two tip cycles? And that's, I think, the discussion that we'd like to have now, so we're looking for anyone who wants to weigh in on that discussion. George. So, um, with all respect to Chris, I mean, actually, I'd like to see uh, 2003 to stay as, you know, the zero year right now. Just from the perspective, I mean, I represent a growing community. We, um, our situation now is different than 2003. So, I do believe it is a valid question of equity in terms of having that broad, um, having that, that, that broad look to, to, yeah, it smooths out for uh, some of the larger communities that have been subject to Dr. Cog funds since then, but for a community like my own and for those of us that are growing, you know, as an equity point, we would should still be fairly low, and so uh, as an equity point, it would be more favorable for us. So I know that sounds horribly selfish, um, but I am here to represent the people of Castle Rock. So that would be my, my point, Chris. I get it. I'll make a comment later. Um, well, <laughs> yes, Elise. I'm happy to defer to the No, chair. no, no, that's okay. Um, well, I was going to, I, I think, and we, ha we had this discussion somewhat in prior MVIC meetings, and maybe we'll have it again. I think regional equity um, makes more sense if we include all of the pots of money, because I think CDOT and RTD and Dr. Cog do some sort of swapping of projects, and Dr. Cog has the opportunity to fully address regional equity by using Dr. Cog monies to fill in the gaps when communities are overlooked in the other funding pots. I think that makes most sense. Um, so I will continue to, to promote that as, I think, the more logical choice. But I would also say in Chris's, I think I, I support where Chris is headed with this, which is um, at what point 
over, over what time frame are we measuring equity? And it becomes less and less meaningful if we're talking about equity of something that happened 30 years ago in a different time and age. And to make it more relevant to the current board members and to the, to the current status of the communities, where they are with their development, where they are with their traffic, it makes sense to look at a more current um, time frame when we're measuring, measuring equity, not just the past tip cycle, I think that's too short, but I think two tip cycles is a pretty good way of balancing that so that we have an opportunity to make sure everybody is getting some benefit, but that benefit is not so historic as to be completely meaningless to the current board members around the table. Other discussion than Val. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I, I, I agree with the conversation that's going on in there, but the, as a point of order on the agenda, I, I, I came prepared to discuss Tier 2, and this items are with, out of the range of the agenda items, so uh, I just kind of raised the point of, uh, of order on that question. The point of order is well taken uh, in that we have a specific uh, action item which uh, addresses the uh, uh, specifically the uh, procedures for preparing uh, TIP to reflect second phase selection criteria by MVIC. That said, second phase selection does have Tier 1 and Tier 2. I think it is fair to say that, in fact, as I read it, that we can talk about the Tier 1 within second phase criteria as part of this discussion. Uh, and the question is, specifically, is there any action that the group wishes to take? I, I'm not trying to push us toward action right now. I, I'd rather have a discussion. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I submit it would be more productive for us to have a discussion to flesh out the comments that uh, Chris and George and uh, Elise have made. The question is, is there further discussion relative to the 2003 to 2019 selection for Dr. Cog programmed funds. And I think, if I could, I'd like to ask Doug to uh, give us a little further explication relative to the TIP cycle, because the TIP cycle, I think, itself is actually a six-year cycle, and we fund on a four-year uh, basis, and so there's, there's perhaps some confusion there, even just figuring that out. So if Doug can take a second to explain that, that might put this into a better context for us. Right, yeah, I mean, our, our TIP is a six-year TIP, although we only fund the first four years of that TIP. And the reason for the six years is really so that we can, um, our f coordination purposes with CDOT, because they have projects in the outlying years that need to be reflected in our TIP and what have you. Um, so yeah, so if we go back, you know, if you suggested maybe two TIP cycles, um, you know, Steve and I were talking offline here. 2007 would be a logical, um, or you know, logical or origin to to begin that discussion, you know, about uh, on the expenditure side. Tim, so I'm going to go ahead and support where Chris is going. I think it makes sense to um, keep the period of time that we're talking about relevant, and as it gets further and further back, I think it gets less relevant. As as Elise was saying, also. Um, so to me, the, the, the two tip cycle time period seems to be um, an appropriate one. And um, you know, it really does keep things in the more current um, context, I think, of, of where the funds have gone. So I'm, I'm supportive of that. And um, I'm tempted to make a motion, Doug, if, I, if you think it's appropriate now. Uh, can we discuss a little bit? OK, for, sure. Yeah. Phil, I'll wait. You're going to defer on making a motion, and you're uh, rec having the well, opportunity to invite Philly to step in. Well, let Philly go ahead, and then I'll and then I'll come back. So, give us. I'm I'm just thank, trying to thank, do this thank informal you, thing. Thank, thank you, Tim. Sure. And I appreciate it, Dougie. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, when we start talking about this, because this mentions 2003 to 2019, which is three tip cycles, but the last tip cycle in that is the first four years of, of that period. So um, it's actually th includes the two prior tip cycles plus what's in the tip cycle. So it's not necessarily terrifically un irrelevant time, 
uh, in that it actually has money that was actually spent versus what's been programmed in the current TIP cycle. So it has two actual periods and then a, a, a program component uh, in, in this particular time frame. Uh, if we move forward and we set the principle that says, you know, take two actual periods in the program period and use that as a rolling period going forward, I, I think that can be fine, but this isn't as long as you might think it is. It doesn't go forever. Uh, it actually just has the, it has the two prior cycles and then the current program cycle. It, is that right, Rex? So. Uh, if you go back to 2003, you're referring yeah. to? I actually, I think it's th maybe three. We had a mini cycle in there. Like yeah. The like everything, nothing is okay, cut so and dry. It's, it's two and a mini. <laughs> two and a mini. <laughs> okay. okay, well, got it. So it's, it's three plus cycles that are in there right now. Yeah, but, but one is a program, one is the current program, and then it's two prior. I mean, if we went with kind of two full cycles and a prior, and plus the program, Right. Correct. So is Chris? Um, I, I want to speak to. Oh, I wanted to yield back to Tim in case he wanted to. Chris, I'll yield the floor to you, and then I'll, I'll go ahead. But go ahead and make your comments. Um, I, I feel there's there's a motion pregnant in okay, the Okay, well, I'll go. I, I could go ahead and, and make it. We could, uh, we could amend it. Chris, would you? Uh, it doesn't really matter to me, but I'll go ahead and say that. I mean, I just, and I'll just say before I make the motion, I think it's important from a policy perspective that we have a rolling period. And I'm just worried that as we go forward, we'll have a longer and longer period. And if we keep 2003 as our baseline, it will become less and less relevant. So uh, Wait, bef before you make a motion, <laughs> okay, Chris. Let me cough up what I got, okay. and, and then I'll kick it back to you. Okay. All right. So, sounds well, like I don't know. I, I'm not in control. I'll let I'll let Dougie do that. Uh, okay. <laughs> Dougie. Yeah. I think Timmy is yielding to Chrissy. Uh, I prefer so Timbo. Tim, Timbo would be better. <laughs> this may be the last Envic meeting I'm chairing, so I'm just going with it, folks. Uh, oh, <laughs> so it's up to Chris okay. now. So. Um, I just want to point something out here, and, and that is, uh, and speaking kind of to, to George's point about you know a growing community, you've got needs that need to be met. This this notion of equity has absolutely no bearing on meeting transportation needs. That's not that's not what this equity formula is constructed around. This equity formula is constructed around a set of variables that are meant to capture how much money your jurisdiction is putting into the transportation kitty versus how much money has been spent in your jurisdiction. Okay, can I just clarify, when you say jurisdiction, it works for Denver, but for everyone else it's the counties. Yeah, right. Or Broomfield. Counties, you're right. No, it's the, the, the unit is county. So how much money the county has contributed to the transportation kitty and how much money the county has gotten back from the transportation kitty has nothing to do with demand, nothing to do with need. And so when you're using contribution variables from today, population today, employment today, VMT today, versus expenditures that were made all the way back to 2003. And in some ways, the dates really don't matter. You have a community, say, like, uh, like Douglas County. I'll, I'll wrap it all into the county. Douglas County, which has grown a lot from 2003 to now, but it's being counted as having contributed based on the population today, VMT today, VM, um, uh, H employment today. But that's being compared to expenditures that have been made all the way back to 2003 when Douglas County wasn't that populated, didn't have that number of people, didn't have that many vehicle miles traveled. You see what I'm saying? This is, this is a financial accounting formula. 
So if it's going to be a financial accounting formula, it should be the same years, and in some ways the years don't really matter, but it should be the same years for both the input and the output side. If you're going to say we're measuring the expenditures that have taken place in Douglas County with Dr. Cog from 2003 to 2019, we need to know what the contributions were from Douglas County from 2003 to 2019. In other words, the population, the VMT, the employment, the HUTF. Because it would be unfair to a county that didn't grow, that was already populated, I don't know what pop county that would be. Well, actually, actually, we're the second fastest growing county in the state. It doesn't matter. But you see what I'm saying. It's, you, you, you're, if, if, it's an, if it's an income, if it's an input-output formula here that you're trying to equilibrate, you have apples and oranges. You have, you know, 2003 to 2019 expenditures, and you're measuring the inputs of 2014, and that's the only year. That doesn't make any sense. If I can, I, I believe that was actually, I'm, I'm trying to keep tabs of it, and I know I'm, I'm losing some control here, but <laughs> we're, we're coming back. Um, I believe that uh, Chris actually had the yield from Tim, so I'll go back to Tim before I recognize John, just to see if uh, Tim has any further comments he wants to make, or if we can move on to John, and then we're going to pose a question to the group. Yeah, we can move on to John. That's fine. I'm happy to yield. Okay, very good. John. Johnny. <laughs> Johnny. Thank you. Um, I, I, think I, I think I'm hearing what Chris is trying to do. And I mean, the input and the output to me is the income and the expense. So that truly is a financial calculation. Um, to me, I think it's more about fairness is what we're trying to get to, that second tier, the small communities, to ensure that if we were growing at some point in the past and we didn't get our fair share, whatever that is, um, that we're trying to articulate that. So I think the percentages, the over equity or under equity, kind of pushes out those other attributes because those, those other attributes aren't quantifiable in that calculation. Um, you have an income, you have an expense, you're either over or you're under. And to me, that's what we're just trying to figure out. Are we getting our fair share or not? And if we are going back to 2003, then we shouldn't be in phase two. But if we aren't, then we should be available to phase two. So to me, that's, that's kind of what we're getting at. And I, I think I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't think it's applicable in that over or under equity calculation. And the question that I was indicating we'd come back to is, OK, we hear the issue. Is there a solution someone is prepared to propose? Uh, we have language before us that we have previously looked at and adopted. And the question is, do we have a solution? Sure, sure. Carmen, mistake. <laughs> um, if we were to to make it so that both sides of the equation cover the same years, is that doable? I, I don't believe it is. No. I, I don't know how you do that on, on the contribution side. I think what, what we hope to accomplish with this, and we're using inputs and outputs, and I'm not sure that's the exact terminology we should be using with this, but basically on the contribution side, what we're trying to get to is this idea of, of fairness, right? This equity idea. So what we, based on the variables that are on the contribution side, what we're trying to determine we know what the population is in the, within the county, right? So we know where the people live, where the people work, how their mode of transportation, how they're getting from, from home to work and other places. And we also know, based on the VM, right, right. <laughs> and um, then also, you know, the Highway Users Trust Fund, the, the, the distribution back to the counties is kind of a proxy for the amount of money that is being raised by that county for transportation purposes. Um, so we felt we had a pretty comprehensive idea of what the, the contribution, or 
you know, a snapshot in time what the communities look like. And then we're trying to see over however many years um, how much money th they've, they've received from various sources. And what we are now so, is Dr. Cog. Um, the complexity, if you tried to do that over 10 years or whatever the time frame we pick is, is that the data might not be available or just the amount of work that would go into getting well, that data for all those years? Well, I'm, I'm not sure what that means, though. So you would want, like, population, an average population over a 10-year period? To well, me, having the most recent population seems to make the most sense. It, I, I hear what Chris is saying in terms of what if we imagine a gold rush town or something. So there's nobody there, and then in the 10th year, there's a big boom and there's a lot, there are a lot of people there. Um, they would be contributing in that 10th year, but the, the fairness equation would say, well, it's not fair that they haven't gotten projects in these former nine years, which doesn't make sense because there was no reason to do projects there in the former nine years because they weren't contributing then and no one was there. Does that make sense? And I, mean, I, and I, know I don't know saying. how much I, of a how much of a real life impact it would have, but to the extent that there was an equation that wasn't too complicated that could match the years <coughs> makes sense to me. Right. Yeah, Let me I just think that the, the expenditure variables, they're additive, and Steve just shot me a note, and I think that makes a lot of sense, whereas, you know, the other the contribution variables, they're not, they're not additive. I mean, you can't, you know, I guess you can, I guess you can average them and weight them somehow, that just, I don't know, seems like an awful lot of work okay. for what we're going to get out of it. Let you know. me recognize Herb, and then we'll come back to Chris, and then George, and then Tim. Anyone else wants to be on the list right now? And Ashley. Okay. So first to Herb. It's kind of like the kid that's got the answer. You got it. He, he's screaming up in the, to be heard in the back. <laughs> I really wasn't wanting to say myself, but I'm watching. I'm watching your shadow over here. Yeah, he's just, I know. He wants to say something so bad that he can't hardly stand it. We're not looking at him. And I think you've got something that you can add to this conversation. So I Go would ahead, rather Steve. hear from you than me. <laughs> I, would, I would love to. So that sounds like a question to staff. Yeah. So if you can Mike, get to a mic. Yes. Nope, please. <laughs> Steve Cook, uh, Dr. Cog, Transportation Planner. Two key points. The expenditures, remember, we're comparing shares. We're not comparing total amounts. We're comparing your county share divided by the regional total of expenditures or of money we've doled out. And then our surrogate proxy estimate of what share you're putting in. Those expenditures vary widely. You'll get nothing for a few years in some communities, and then you'll get a whole bunch of money. So that goes up and down here. The revenue side in which we look at population shares, remember your percent of the, of the region is 22%. That 22% hasn't changed that much in the last 10 years. You know, If you really looked at maybe it's 22.0, 21.9, it's pretty much the same. VMT, those shares by county really haven't changed over that 10 years. Uh, the other one, the uh, fuel, HUT, once again, the, the, the share amongst the counties really hasn't changed, whereas the expenditures, well, that's what varies widely, which is why we want to do that additive to say, let's not look at just one tip or one year. Let's look at a wide range and maybe not go back as far as 03 of expenditures compared to our most recent data on these surrogates for revenue contribution which really don't change that much year to year from a share standpoint. So if that helps or hurts or... To, to the explanation, Steve, thank you. No, I, I think that's, that's... I thought he was about to jump out of that chair at four Very beneficial. Just, <laughs> like you can see it. I, I either yeah. got to get a hold of that microphone. <laughs> but to the explanation, I don't know that we're gaining anything by trying to change the period. I think what we have is we have a very extensive calculation process. It may not be perfect, but it, it is the best that we are offered 
by what we have available to us. So I'm not sure that changing this is going to solve any anybody's real question because there's not a solid answer there. And I don't know that you guys can come up with a better answer than you got right now. And if I may, I think, I'll add you, Phil, if, if I can, I think what I'm hearing as the the real concern is not using 2003-2019 for this tip, but rather s what I hear is setting a precedent that in future years we will always look back to 2003. And that, I think, is the issue that I've heard framed, and so I want to make sure that we stay focused with that. And with that, I have Chris, then George, then Tim, then Ashley, then Phil. So let me go back to Chris. I would. I think you're right, Mr. Chair, about sort of the 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 issue of what the whether the time frame is established at 2003 or whether it it rolls forward and how big that space should be. But I, I do want to just sort of point out the perversity of if we have these contribution variables that are meant to capture something, either financial contributions or contributions to the demand for transportation expenditures, the two things have to speak to each other. We have population and employment, vehicle miles traveled, <clears throat> but no reference to transit or bicycles, and yet a bunch of the programmed funds are precisely for transit and bicycles. I don't know. It, 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 seems, it seems perverse, but you, you guys know I have a, an issue with how this is constructed in the first place and maybe I can waste some more of your time after we've adopted this with a discussion of that. <laughs> Thank you Chris. George. So actually. And, and then uh, Tim, then Ashley, then Phil. So I mean actually at this stage of the game I can so totally support um, having, you know, not letting uh, 2003 be zero year of, of going ahead and rolling it based on what we said. Mm -hmm. For this document Today, though, I mean, I thought Phil's analysis was uh, very informative to me in terms of we, we really are in that, that two-tip cycle um, phase going 2003 to 2019, albeit with staff's commentary about the mini-cycle that was in there. So for, uh, well, for to, but, you know, it's, that, it's the concept of the mini-cycle, which I'm sure we could be entertained with uh, the details of that. It's, it's a little bit bigger than a unicycle. <laughs> Outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> Almost a bicycle, if you will. <laughs> so uh, from that perspective, I mean, I, uh, I, I, could, I could definitely be interested when the motion is made to support a, this idea of a precedent-setting rolling cycle moving forward. <clears throat> Today, I do like the 2003 and 2019, um, and uh, I think that's, that concludes my comment right now. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Tim, back to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate what Chris was saying about the contribution variables and wanting to have a time frame the same, but I'm, for me, the expenditure variables are, or you can aggregate them more easily. I think with some of the, the variables that we have on the contribution side, it's a little bit harder to figure out how to aggregate those over a period of years. And I'm not really sure how you do that. Um, and I'm a little bit, uh, my, my concern about that's a little bit lessened from what I heard from staff and that the, they're not changing that much, they're much more static. Whereas the expenditure side tends to go up and down a lot more. Um, so uh, I don't know how you do that exactly, Chris. Um, and so I'm still happy to really look at the expenditure variables and limit that time frame and, and not have 2003 be the, the baseline, but we, we create a, a policy decision that we're going to have a rolling time period. And from my perspective, I, well, from what I've heard, you know, I think that the two-tip cycle time frame would be appropriate. I, I heard what Phil said about the, the program period, too, and maybe understand a little bit more about that. But I, I do think that as a body, it would be worth saying, okay, let's go ahead and try to get this to be rolling so that something, you know, 20 years or 30 years from now that, you know, people are thinking about this, we don't still have 2003 as the baseline. I don't, that doesn't make sense to me. So, um, so I'm very interested still in, in creating 
that kind of language that replaces what we have there now with the static um, the baseline and going. And I think that you know for me that the two tip cycle would probably be the the appropriate time frame. Um, but I just I do have a question for staff. And so how would that work in terms of? I just want to understand that that if you, we we went with the two tip cycles versus what Phil was talking about in the kind of program period. Can you talk about that a little bit, please? I mean, because I, I, I'm just trying to figure out for the motion language what's the most appropriate. So, if you can help me, help me with that. Right. I I think that if you know we would like to clarify it or, or classify it more in in number of years as opposed to tip cycles, like fiscal years. Say that be, you know, a period of 10 years or a period of 12 years, whatever that might be. Because in the event that we do have this mini cycles or whatever, so what do you okay. count then? A mini cycle plus a full cycle. You know what I mean? So. If we had a set number of years and just roll that in uh -huh. future future tip discussions, um, and whatever I, I'm not sure what the appropriate number would be, 12 years maybe that would be, you know, four potential tip cycles or three plus. Uh, well, that that makes sense to me in the sense that we have these mini or the uni cycles, um, and and those will be really hard to calculate if if we have that going forward as a, as our metric. So I, I'm, I'm glad I asked, because I think that the actual number of years might be appropriate. So, um, so I'll actually go ahead and offer the motion that we say doctor program funds for the uh, period of the preceding 12 years. Second. All right, we have a motion on the table to amend the language from Dr. Cog program funds paren 2013-2019 paren only to Dr. Cog programmed funds for the previous 12 years. And we have a motion by Tim and a second by Phil on that. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd like to have discussion on the motion. I know Ashley and Phil had also indicated they wanted to speak. Ashley, do you want to speak to the motion? Yeah, that would be great. So I'm a little disappointed that I don't get a pet name, but that's all right. <laughs> so I was going we to do the exact it. same thing, um, except the language is a little bit off to me. If you, if you just say the previous 12 years, it's 2014. So I mean, that brings us back to 2002. So that's right. Yeah. I mean, so that's not quite right either. Right. But I support the um, intent of the motion. I would say 12 years in total. So it would really, in this case, it would be eight preceding years plus the four additional. The four, you know, that is part of the the current the tip that we'll be working on. Is that consistent, Tim, with your understanding as the maker of the motion? Not what the motion says. No. Well, not exactly. No, uh, it doesn't say that. No, it doesn't say that. I mean, I'm. Should. I I take it as a friendly. Sure, I I, I can accept that as a friendly. And who's, so who's if we my have the maker the and the second accepting that as a friendly amendment, do you want to articulate that again so that Connie has the benefit of that for the minutes, please? Me? Yes. Um, so my understanding of the motion is that it would include a total of 12 years. So that would be basically it would be eight years um, of prior TIP investment plus the four years of the one that we'll be working on. So it's basically it's 08 pro yes. So it's 08 through oh through 2019. Sure, thanks for the clarification. That's good. All right. So we have an understanding on the motion. Are we set with that, Connie? Okay. Um, Phil, you were next on the list anyway, and you seconded the motion. Would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, I'd like to uh, speak to uh, one element that Chris raised earlier, just to put it up for the reason why transit and bicycle aren't included is because um, they don't contribute on the on that side so this is kind of trying to keep the numerator and the denominator um, I'm sorry Phil could you speak softer because I almost <laughs> heard you <coughs> so I just want to make sure that okay what I was doing <coughs> was mentioning to Chris that the reason why transit and bicycle are not included is not that they're insignificant as far as transportation, uh, but that they don't have actually dollars to contribute. Uh, so hence the vehicles, miles traveled, and the, and the like, um, and the HUTF are, are there. I mean, th that's kind of the practical side of it. Um, if we have a way of, uh, you know, sometime in the future actually getting inventories or counts of bicyclists that are actually commuting for work versus those that may be out on the trail 
for exercise, that might be an interesting uh, survey to take. Uh, but uh, with regard to the eight prior years plus the program year, I think that kind of gets us to a 10-ish that you were looking at earlier. Uh, it's kind of uh, in the middle. So, Further comments on the motion? Anyone wishing to speak to the motion or are we ready for the question? It would appear we are ready for the question and uh, the motion would be to amend the tier one discussion on the equity status and ratio factor looking at expenditure variables uh, to change to Dr. Cog programmed funds for the, and, uh, and, and forgive me for the language again, for the eight years plus the program years? Yes. For eight years plus the current program years, as opposed to using what appeared to be a baseline of 20, uh, 2003, which would then be a policy that could carry forward and hopefully preclude the necessity for this conversation in years to come although I'm certain that will never stop us. Um, <laughs> all those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Are there any opposed? The chair hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. That's not bad. One hour on the one action item. That was, that was well done. That was well done. Uh, oh, we're not done because we need now the overall motion to... We want to move to direct staff is the requested motion to work with TAC on the development of second phase project funding scenarios. And so moved. Doug, uh, any, any further thoughts on that? None. And we have a motion. Is there a second? I heard a second as well. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on that motion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? The chair hears none. That passes unanimously. That now concludes Thank you very uh, much. the agenda item. And we turn to the informational items uh, that we have for your consideration this evening. The first one is the data portal update. And that's attachment C in your materials. And we have with us our information systems manager for administration and finance, Ms. Ashley Summers. Good afternoon or good evening now, Ms. Summers. Yes, good evening to all of you. Thank you for letting me speak this evening. Um, I'm excited to tell you about the things we've been working on. My team, uh, the information systems team, is made up of GIS analysts who make maps and do spatial analysis, and also software developers. And we work together with our economists and our urban planners to generate information uh, to inform all of you. And uh, so today I'm going to talk about the multifaceted approach that we take to data and information management and how we plan to bring more information to you in a more engaging way over the next several months. Some of the things that, um, or I guess the major components of our job is to collect data, to analyze this data, then visualize information, and then distribute this information back out. We do this because our goal is to help you all be able to make data-driven decisions so that we can plan more effectively for our region. To give you a little bit of context, um, I'll tell you just generally what kind of information we're talking about. And this is not an exhaustive list, but it helps to explain some of the things we're working on. Uh, one of the things that we do at Dr. Cog is bring in local information and uh, aggregate it and compile it into standardized regional data sets. And we do this because we want to better understand the bigger picture. Uh, we also uh, me, um, contribute to the measurement of our MetroVision goals. So while you were here at this table helping us to figure out what goals uh, that we need to measure for 2040, my team is simultaneously working on mining that data and figuring out how we can measure those goals so we can see progress, so we can inform um, uh, uh, the, the region uh, on how we're doing. Many of you are probably also familiar with our population and employment forecast. We do this, uh, our socioeconomic team actually produces these forecasts by using a cutting edge um, model called UrbanSim. That model runs on very, very detailed data sets that um, the information systems team comes up with. So these are the types of information that we are trying to compile and gather. And the plan is to 
be able to show that more effectively so it's more engaging and more interactive so we get more eyes on that information. So just briefly, I'll tell you where we get that data. Um, some of it we have to buy. Some of it we get from state and federal agencies. And some, most of it we try to gather from our local governments. And we do that because we know that the most detailed um, and the best data is really at the local level because that's where the experts are interacting with the things on the ground. So in the past, we have tried to gather this data from our local governments, and it hasn't been as successful as we'd like it to be. And there's several reasons for that. Um, we've, we've asked for the data um, with, in several different formats with different methods. We've compiled it through email, through FTP sites, through DVDs. And there were multiple points of contact on either side. Uh, as well as multiple requests from inside Dr. Cog throughout the year. And we felt like we could really do a better job with this. We also weren't getting great feedback on the licensing restrictions and the data use attached to the data. And it's very important to us to understand how your data can and should be used. We want to honor that, but we need to understand it first. Um, in the past, we've also had a minimal opportunity for uh, open collective dialogue on data throughout the region, and that's one of the things we wanted to fix. And we noticed, we got some feedback that there may have been some confusion about what we need, why we need it, why it's important, um, and all of these logistical questions. And so after our last data collection effort from last year, we took our lessons learned and and try to figure out how we could make a better solution that makes things easier on your staff, makes us all more effective, and generally increases the transparency around this um, effort. And thus the data portal was born. So the data portal <laughs> is, um, is an online interactive site that we're going to be um, deploying in the next few months to your staff so they can use that to give, uh, to. Uh, supply data to Dr. Cog. And the great thing about it is that it's, it's a lot more user friendly. It's a one stop shop type application where it's easier to upload and download information. And we hope that the uh, effect of that is that we'll have more data transactions. We will have more data going to your staff and more data um, coming into Dr. Cog. It also does a great job of tracking these transactions. So in the past, when we would have data coming in, um, through emails and through DVDs. We try and get that all in an Excel spreadsheet, and there was just a lot of room for human error. And honestly, we felt that that was unacceptable, and so now we have uh, a site that automatically tracks everything that goes in and out, so we always have something to refer to. Uh, we've built in some forum functionality, which allows us inside the site to, uh, to talk to your staff about data and for staffs of uh, different jurisdictions to talk with each other, to ask questions, to learn more about how everyone else is dealing with the similar issues that, that we're all thinking about. And also, only our member governments have access to this site. So it's a secure area for us to collaborate on data that um, may not be ready yet or may never be ready for public eyes. This is just a collaboration site for us. Um, there's also several options for how to share data. So again, I'll state we, we want to honor the data restrictions that you may have. And so there are options for uh, specifying that you just want to share information with Dr. Cog for our internal purposes, um, or you want to share it with all the members of the site, so your neighboring jurisdictions, or you're OK with eventually having it aggregated as a regional data set and shared to the public. And these three distinctions are very, very useful and things that we haven't gotten feedback um, on at a, at a regional uh, scale for in the past. And that once we do this, it's going to help us um, with several things. It's going to help us make sure that we do exactly what you want with your data and also help us tease out those data sets that can be more publicly distributed so that we get more data out there so we can make more uh, informed decisions. And finally, we're consolidating our request with this site. Um, not only are we working within Dr. Cog to make sure that we only make one request a year to your staff, we're also partnering with other agencies like the state, the Offer Office of Information Technology, so that, um, so that your staff doesn't have to respond to so many people with the same thing. 
So take, for example, uh, buildings information. Dr. Cog asks for this every year. It it's basically addresses for all the structures in your jurisdiction. And we ask for that, and then a few months later, OIT asks for the same thing. Because OIT knows what we have created with the data portal, and they support us in this endeavor, they've decided to work with us this year um, to consolidate the requests. So we will ask for the data that they need. We'll compile it. Your staff will only have to respond one time, and then we'll um, funnel that state requested data onto them on your behalf. We're hoping that this makes uh, things easier and saves time you know, for, for your staff. So I put some screenshots in here, but I can actually do a live demo. This is, this is really just to make sure that the demo goes right. It's kind of a, appeasing the gods. Um, here we go. So let me log in real quick. So one of the things you'll see is that uh, each jurisdiction has their own organization. This is an area where they can uh, put all the data sets related to their own uh, jurisdiction. And it's a place where Dr. Cog can see what's going on here. And also, neighboring jurisdictions can see what you may or may not be sharing. <laughs> um, so, so we haven't uh, officially asked for any data yet. Uh, we will be doing that in January. So the data sets that are loaded in right now are coming from Open Colorado. Open Colorado is a statewide public data sharing site, and our applications are based on the same underlying platform. So what we've done is if a jurisdiction has already opened up their data and already taken the time to upload that information to Open Colorado and share it with the public, we're not going to ask your staff to supply that to us again. We're going to automatically go get it. Our site automatically mines data and pulls it in once it's publicly shared from Open Colorado. Again, we're hoping that that saves um, staff time for you all. Um, so that's why you're seeing some of these jurisdictions are already sharing on Open Colorado. We've taken the liberty of mining that data, and now we won't have to ask them for that later on. Let's see. Um, another thing that is, as I mentioned earlier, is going to be helpful for us is that this is, makes it very transparent uh, for us to show what license agreements we're bound by. And that's useful for Dr. Cog and it's useful for all of you to make sure that we're on the same page on what we've signed and uh, how we can use data. And we think that this is just smarter business going forward to make sure that we use things the way you want them to be used. Um, let's see, what else do I want to show? Oh, um, so in terms of dialogue, each one of these uh, each one of these data sets and each one of these organizations has an area where you can make comments. And of course it's not coming up right now. <laughs> uh, but it, it's a, it, yeah, it's a, it's a forum uh, opportunity where people can just pose questions uh, just like an, an online internet forum and others can respond to that. And in that way, we keep track of the of the conversations we're having and have a record of that, of that type of information. One of the other really interesting things that we have built into this site is an interactive map which shows what data is available on the site by area. So you can see, um, based on county or municipalities, who has is, who is supplied the most data and where we have data gaps. And this is just a helpful visual tool for us to see uh, where we need to close these gaps so we have more regional collaboration and a richer dialogue on data. Now this site is going to be the way, the primary way that we collect data going forward in the future. And because of that, we, we want to make sure that we've done some really effective outreach so that your staff feels comfortable. So over the past two weeks, we've held two hands-on training workshops. They're about three hours long each, and we've had um, about 30 or so uh, attendees show up and walk through the site with us, and we've explained uh, why it's useful and, and what our plan is with it, and helped them get used to interacting with the site. We're planning to do some more outreach over the next couple of months to make sure that our official launch and request in January 2015 uh, is successful. 
One of the other things that is good here, it's not just about Dr. Cog bringing data in, although that's the primary reason we built it. Uh, it also allows easy download for your staff to get more information. So one of the things we have in here right now is our info group data. This data Dr. Cog purchased uh, for its own internal purposes to help us with our, our modeling. Um, and it's worth about $30,000. And we've made it available here for people and just within our jurisdictions that have signed license agreements, now they can just go in here and easily download that themselves. So overall, the idea is just to have um, more dialogue on data, more transactions with data, and an easier um, upload and download type situation with everyone. Does anybody have a, any questions about this in particular? Are there questions for Ashley? Philly, you're up. <laughs> Ashley, um, at least as I've uh, talked about data and um, in some areas um, with the city, we're dependent upon the county assessor's office for buildings and some of the GIS. Mm -hmm. um, as you're looking at this, you're separating each jurisdiction, but you have both counties and cities. Um, how do you reconcile that where the data uh, for a city might actually reside with the county? That's one of the things that we'll be able to capture here with the dialogue piece. Um, once we make the data requests, if there are some things that you won't provide because they will come from someplace else, you'll be able to document that in the site, which is very helpful because then we can all refer back to it later so that we know where the data's coming from. And then we'll, we'll go and mine it from that other jurisdiction. Okay, and then um, um, what might be good is to, uh, if jurisdictions have or have not signed a license agreement that we might be aware of that because <coughs> we might not have that intimate relationship with uh, the data mining folks or the data providing folks at, at the cities. Mm -hmm. And um, the other is a uh, um, very important question. Uh, knowing that uh, your folks are out there data mining, what is the uh, evacuation or extrication plan for when they're down in the mines? <laughs> we have canaries. <laughs> See? That's Ask a silly question. <laughs> the answer is a very good answer. You might hear a tweet later. <laughs> <laughs> Chris? Um, just a question about, I, I totally followed you on all the, the, the innovation and changes you're making here with respect to how you gather data mm -hmm. to apply to our regional enterprise. But then the piece where, uh, uh, you know, different, uh, you know, member jurisdictions can come back into the database mm -hmm. and look at data can they look at data from other jurisdictions or just that collection of info, whatever it was you called it? Um, the, if a jurisdiction says that um, their data can be seen by other members of the site, okay. then other member jurisdictions can log in and see that information. So when you go oh, to okay. your um, data sets area, it, it'll include it. all different jurisdictions. Um, so so that, that's where the whole license agreement comes in is like what are the what are the terms under which you're okay. getting this data yeah other jurisdictions can look at it so then that becomes open so we can communicate right yes to each other not just and when you when you add a data set here when you upload things there are uh, there's an opportunity to say uh, I do or do not want to share this with the public and that gives us really clear feedback on what we can do with it and then this says whether it should be public or private within the site so that means can I share it? Do, do you just want Dr. Cog to see it because we need help with our planning? Uh, or do you want to share it with your neighbors in the site? So that helps give us really clear direction on how to manage this data set, these data sets. And all of these are automatic. So once you make a selection, the site will lock down or open up certain data sets to be viewed by everyone else. Thank you. George. Ashley, what's user access on this? Is it uh, one user per? member organization? Is it multiples as needed? It's, it's as needed and at your discretion. We ask that each one of the jurisdictions have two admins at least just as a backup so that they can manage the users and manage their content. 
um, but you can have as many as many members and users on the site as you'd like to have. Anthony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I actually just have a bit of commentary and some questions that are still percolating here in the back of my mind. There it is again. I'm back, and I'm in stereo. So the city and county of Denver is actually going through uh, a remarkable growth spurt around special events activity in the city, and the mayor just recently stood up a special events office. They're actually examining a, a comparable project with data sharing around those special events activities and how they may impact our regional partners. We're very interested in getting some regional feedback around that sort of data sharing for those events. And so if possible, I'd love to arrange a, a meeting for kind of your staff to, to brief us to see if there are synergies that we might bring to larger groups' attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the observation and the offer, as always, gracious of Denver. Any other questions for Ashley from anyone? More? I do have some more if, you, if you'd like to see some more <laughs> on a different topic. Um, do you have time? What time? We, we have a few moments. If uh, there's no objection, please go on ahead. Okay. I'll switch gears and show you about um, a project we have upcoming that's not, uh, not ready to launch yet. We're just thinking and brainstorming about it, but I think it's very exciting and we want to share it with you early on. We're calling it what it is. It's, it's Data Information Visualizations and Analysis, or DIVA for short. We get a kick out of it. Uh, <laughs> we expect it to be high maintenance, but very pretty. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> the whole point, the whole point of this project is to get more information in a more engaging format onto our website for for you, for your staff, for the public, for everyone, just so we have more information on our site. And this is not very pretty right now. These are just placeholders because we're trying to. Um, a brainstorm about how we want the site to look, but I can show you um, what we're thinking in terms of interactive graphics. So this, for example, um, is a quick mock-up of our population forecast. And what we're trying to do is get a lot of information in map format, in table format, in graph format out at the same time so that you can look at a regional picture, get some quick information, get some understanding in a very, very fast manner, and then drill down if you want to into uh, uh, down to a local level. We're hoping that to create dashboards for you uh, so that you can investigate issues uh, as quickly but as uh, detailed as possible. And these things will help you drill down um, to different areas and also see the population, which I know it's hard on the screen to see, the population forecast all the way out to 2040. And when you hover over this, you get more information, like what is the percent change? What is that population estimate going to be? And this, in this way, you can interact with it a little more than if it was just a static paper copy. Um, one other thing that I'll show you that's coming out of this project, we've just started creating these visualizations. We're really playing at this point, but they said I could tell you about them, so I'm going to. Um, we've started looking at commuting patterns. and. We're, this is census data here, but we're trying to visualize it in a much better way than just looking at census tables. And what this is showing us right now, we're looking at um, jobs that are in Adams County where the people that work those jobs don't live in Adams County. And so you can roll over these, of course it's going to load right now, okay. You can roll over uh, these areas and see um, what these lines mean. Of course, their thickness is related to how many commuters. But if you roll over these, you can see there's 22,000 jobs that exist in Adams County where the workers live in Jefferson County. And you can just get information like this uh, by rolling over these things, by zooming in. You can also change um, and interact with this visualization to say, well, I'd like to really investigate the work county uh, being Arapahoe County. Or I want to change what home counties I'm looking at. So. So the whole point here is just to help um, help you get information a little bit faster and help things make a little more sense. We tried to create this visualization um, with uh, on static maps, and it looks like this. 
<laughs> and that's horrifying, right? I mean, that's, you can't get any information out of that. That's, we, we tried to color code it too, and then it just looked like a rainbow spider web, and we thought, this is not, this is not gonna work, right? You can't get the information you need out of this. And that's why we thought this interactivity is gonna be the way to go. This is what's going to help you get the information you need as quickly as possible, and this is gonna help you drill down to the areas that you're interested in in a really quick manner. That's the whole point of this project. So there's more to come on this. We're, we're working right now with various teams at Dr. Cog, MetroVision team, the forecasting team, um, our travel transportation team, um, to find out what stories we need to tell, what issues we need to investigate, what visualizations are gonna be useful, and what narratives and context need to be given to those visualizations. So that's the, the main gist of this project, and we're, we're pretty excited about it, uh, although it's in its very early stages. Are there questions about that? George. So Ashley, um, that's really cool. I think everybody agrees with that. One of the things that, just going through here, it strikes me, those of us that were on the um, Economic Vitality Subcommittee, mm -hmm. this really kind of dovetails with one of the map requests we pushed back on Brad about wanting to see. I mean, is there a, cons uh, obviously you're just starting, have you considered uh, what would uh, you know, a road map to include town to town, uh, town to a specific, um, you know, uh, economic hub. We're working on employment centers right now with the same analysis. Groovy. Um, and we're w working with Brad's team to figure out what um, technically the employment center should contain um, and what tracks are appropriate. Once we get that figured out, we'll do the same thing with that. So it's not just at the county level. And George, cool. if you say far out, do that. <laughs> hey man, I was born in 1968. I'm allowed to talk like this. <laughs> Other other comments or questions for <laughs> Ashley? As I understand it, Dr. Cog's diva may be high maintenance, but worth it. So that's a... Okay, I got one more. Oh, and you got one more. Okay, <laughs> here we go. All right, I'm going to switch gears again, and I'm going to show you our, our new tip map. And this is the last tip data, but we just wanted to show you what we could do here. Um, if you zoom into this map, it's got all the TIP projects on it, color-coded by what type of project they are, so whether they're roadway, transit, bike ped, um, or studies. And once you zoom in, you can like hover over these points, and then you get information that pops up and tells you the project type and the TIP ID, and then the amounts that are being contributed towards that project. Mm -hmm. And then once you click on it, you get Street View, so you can check it out and see what's happening in that area. Now, we know that it's going to be a little more useful for you to see before and after photos for TIP projects, and we haven't figured that out yet, but we're working on it. This just shows the current street view of what's in Google Maps at any given time. But it still gives you an idea of kind of where you're looking at, helps you get oriented with uh, something you might be talking about here related to these projects. Well, wouldn't, it, wouldn't the before and after be based upon a Google update? Um, the issue with Google is that they don't um, let us have access to their archive photos, so we wouldn't, we won't know exactly how to get those those photos in a quick manner. So we're still brainstorming about how we can pull that off. Right now, the we just got it to work with the current stuff, whatever's up there right now. <coughs> That's all I have. <laughs> And Ashley, very well done. And we thank you so much for that uh, report. Lots of exciting things. Uh, it's uh, even better than all the, the graphics and toys that they had on TV last night with uh, the election <laughs> results. I felt like I was watching Tom Cruise in Minority Report as they were flipping around the screens and stuff. We then turn to our uh, last informational item, uh, and that's the Transportation Improvement Program funding pools and uh, programs. You have attachment D with information on that. And once again, we return to our Director of Transportation Planning and Operations, Mr. Doug Rex. Good evening again, Mr. Rex. Actually, Steve his, is going to cover his, uh, it. taller and older shadow <laughs> is, uh, is, is going to be here, and uh, I, I am not a diva. And uh, though I have been, though I have been called groovy and super cool. Okay. All right, on on that note, that's uh, this is just a real quick briefing here, probably probably uh, five minutes. Uh, did the wrong one there. Uh, five minutes here to talk about a couple of upcoming 
additional call for calls for projects that will be coming up the next, uh, one coming up next month, another one coming up, the other one's coming up over the next six months for some set-aside programs that you've already approved that will be part of our next TIP. These are some uh, set-asides where we'll select specific smaller scale projects over the next few years, but we want to get you and your staff uh, thinking about these uh, over the next uh, several months. Uh, the pools we're going to briefly discuss here are the regional TDM program, set-aside program, the stationary and master plans and urban center studies, uh, an air quality improvements program, miscellaneous traffic signal equipment uh, purchase. So these are the four that will be uh, coming up. All of these historically have been uh, funded with our, through our CMAC program, our CMAC dollars, congestion mitigation air quality. And they're, in the past, we've described these as being kind of part of our you know, buffet of types of projects that we use to help manage congestion, improve air quality, uh, and the like. So the first one um, that will be coming up is our regional TDM program. We will be selecting projects for fiscal years 2016 and 2017. Um, there is a grand total of $1.6 million per year that you uh, approved, I don't know, three, four months ago. Um, the components of this uh, set-aside program is initially uh, we currently take uh, $560,000 of that $1.6 million a year off the top to go to our partnership program that works with way to go and that goes to our various transportation management associations around the region so such as US 36 commuting solution downtown Denver partnership the South I-25 corridor so that's taken off the top then that'll leave about a million dollars remaining per year to go towards some of our what we'll call traditional travel demand management or TDM programs that deal with uh, marketing programs to get people to use transit, carpool, uh, and bicycle. Goes to our local governments, our transportation management associations that I just mentioned, and some other uh, nonprofit agencies have used those dollars uh, in the past. Uh, we'll be working with uh, the TAC and also uh, closely with CDOT and FHWA uh, and the stakeholders to provide input on our criteria, our rules. Uh, CDOT and FHWA are very important here as compared to some of our other things because uh, CDOT is the uh, contracting agencies for most of these, or contracting agency for most of the projects here, so they keep a close tabs on things. And Federal Highway Administration, FHWA, these are their dollars, has actually taken pretty close scrutiny on expenditures in these categories over the last several years. So they have actually participated in the crafting of the evaluation criteria and rules. We anticipate coming before this group uh, probably in March, maybe February, uh, but likely March to approve our evaluation criteria and eligibility rules and things like that. It'll probably be April time frame that applications uh, will be due uh, and then make the selections in the summer. Uh, the second program that will be coming up is our station area master plans and urban center studies. Um, that's right now allocated at $600,000 per year. Uh, this began back in, I think it was fiscal year 2007, in conjunction with Fast Tracks. As Fast Tracks was getting, go getting going, the communities out there were saying, well, we could really use some funds to plan around the stations. And so the Station Area Master Plan, or stamps, were created. And many of your communities out there have received these dollars uh, and already completed some studies. And so we do the, uh, uh, what are eligible are the initial Station Area Plans, <coughs> next step studies, which is kind of an offshoot of the station area plans. An example there, uh, I think, is Englewood, where uh, they did a station area study. Part of that su study said, well, let's look at connections across Santa Fe to the other side of Santa Fe. Well, then they got a next step study to do more thorough analysis of what that crossing may be. So it's a very uh, good process. Uh, already mentioned, there's been dozens of studies by local governments. 
um, that uh, call for projects will be uh, in spring of 2015 is the current uh, current schedule for that. Our, our third category is our air quality improvements program. Uh, this you did a set aside for this tip. The dollars will be administered by the Regional Air Quality Council in conjunction uh, with Dr. Cox, so they will work closely with us. Um, types of programs in here, pro sub-projects in here. Vehicle fleet technology, this can be uh, putting in uh, compressed natural gas or CNG or electric vehicles, diesel retrofits on school buses, uh, garbage trucks, things like that. It's uh, the RACS Ozone Aware Program and also some other local government agency projects. Uh, in the past, there's been things like uh, street sweepers that we funded in some of your communities. I think actually Parker, I think we funded a street sweeper five, six years ago. So I think it's got Dr. Cog embossed on the side of it with a, <laughs> no. Way to go. Way to go. <laughs> and, it, and it's parked in John's driveway. <laughs> Way to sweep. Uh, and also uh, de-icer programs. Uh, we funded uh, some uh, communities and also CDOT for uh, de-icer storage, a liquid de-icer, because that's less polluting uh, than the typical sand. And that program, uh, Call for Projects, will likely be late next summer after they work with us uh, to create that work program. And the final uh, category is our miscellaneous uh, traffic signal equipment purchase program. There's going to be $780,000 approximately available for really the current fiscal year that we just started. And these are left, I don't want to call them leftover funds, but contingency funds from our overall traffic signal system program that go out to little projects in many of your communities. Uh, there's been over 50 projects uh, in the last eight years in 18 of your jurisdictions uh, out there for things from purchasing communication equipment, uh, traffic signal boxes, you know, big things sitting on the corner that you gotta mow the grass around or shovel the snow around. Uh, bicycle detection in Denver got some money through this miscellaneous equipment program to put in detection uh, for bicycles at, at traffic lights. Um, so this has been a really good program. That call for projects is coming up uh, very shortly. Uh, with the selections to be made uh, early next year. You know, this tends to be your, your technical public works staff getting involved in this, so you may not have ever even heard of it unless it came across the budget table when you're looking at budgets and you said, you know, what's this $10,000 for, you know, signal equipment? Well, it's a good chance that some of the money for that may have come uh, from us. So just wanted to give you that uh, quick update on things that are coming up and if there are any questions on any of those I are there questions for I Steve because he, he's available f by phone for later questions or email but if you have any now this is your opportunity hearing none thank you very much Steve You're good welcome. report we appreciate that um, are there any other matters to come before the MVIC at this time Elise I wanted to take the uh, opportunity to thank our esteemed chair for his service. I know that um, this may potentially be your last MVIC meeting where you chair. We can only hope that you'll come back in a different um, form, maybe in a, you know, five years as you've been known to do. Um, but uh, yeah, I just want to recognize that um, while we're, there are a lot of differences around this table, there are um, really important things that unite us, and that's our service to our communities and our service to the region. And um, we also all have to go through the hell of um, campaigning. And uh, it's a huge loss to Dr. Cog to let go of you. Our meetings, at a minimum, will be a lot less fun and colorful. And I just wanted to thank you for your years of service. That is very kind and gracious. I appreciate that, all, all of you. Thank you very much. Um, our next meeting, should we have one, uh, is scheduled for December the 3rd. Uh, do expect that you will have an announcement from Connie sometime on or before uh, November 19. So uh, two weeks from today, we should know 
whether we're going to ask you to interrupt your holiday uh, party festivities and season to uh, come to an MVIC meeting, but uh, it, it appears we may not need that, so we may uh, avoid that necessity. And should that be the case, may I say that it has been a distinct uh, honor, privilege, and pleasure for me to serve as your chair for this period of time. I can't think of a more engaged and engaging group to uh, preside over than you. So I thank you for that privilege. Unless there is further business, we stand adjourned. <laughs>